Welcome to the latest episode of Mob Talk Sit Down. I'm Dave Schrantweiser. And I'm George Anastasia. George, two big bombshells in the mob world. The murder of Gambino crime boss Frank Cali in New York and information out of Philadelphia that the FBI may have been working with a member of a terrorist organization from Lebanon to get Phil Narducci. Yeah, both are stranger than fiction. All right, George, let's start up in the Big Apple in New York. The murder of alleged Gambino crime boss Frank Cali, Frankie boy, uh, outside his home. We now have a suspect who's been in court, Anthony Camello, 24 years old from Staten Island. Didn't take much for the cops to catch this guy, but good detective work. Yeah, I mean, arrest within almost 24 hours. They scooped the guy up in New Jersey and, and extradited him to, to Staten Island. And, you know, it's we had all the speculation about where this hit was coming from, who was involved. And it may end up to be simply a, a, a domestic situation. Yeah, the reports out there indicate that he may have been trying to date the niece of Callie, and Callie had told him to stay away. There's also some reports that he was hanging outside the house yeah. the day of the murder, might have gone up to the front door and rang the doorbell. What do you make of all this? Well, I mean, I think it's coming out in bits and pieces, but it, it looks like we've got a troubled individual, this guy, and I think that might end up being his offense. You know, he's got issues. Uh, His own lawyer said that. There's, yeah. there's some unanswered questions here that we got to get to the bottom of. Exactly. I mean, the, but, the, you know, the way it went down, I, it, it, you've got to wonder about uh, his motivation. He obviously he went there with a gun, with, would indicate the intention to do some harm to somebody. Yeah. And I don't want to make light of it, but it was rather simplistic. It wasn't very complicated. Yeah. He either did or didn't knock on the door. He ran this car into Callie's car. Callie comes out and now he's shot in and he's dead. Yeah. Uh, you know, we talk about all mob hits and planning and backups and, and getaway drivers and all that kind of stuff. This was just one and done, boom. And it worked, obviously, yeah. for, for, Tragically. His, for his Tragically. intentions. Yeah. Some other information here that uh, he might smoke pot, he has some mental health problems, he might have been hanging out inside City Hall in New York trying to make a citizen's arrest on de Blasio, stuff like that. He had some stuff written on his hand that, in a courtroom, in courtroom on Monday. Yeah in Ocean County, talk about that. Yeah, and that almost politicized this kind of case. He's exactly. Got, he's got the, the Magna and uh, uh, Patriot and all that kind of stuff, which you know, either he's got mental problems or he's playing a game here yeah. and trying to divert attention. And uh, it, it, it almost is an this attempt- This is no game. Yeah, but it's an <laughs> yeah. attempt to politicize this. And yeah. it, that's kind of a good segue into the situation here in Philadelphia where we talk the, kind of the blend of politics and organized crime and we're seeing uh, the situation with Narducci, which has raised some serious right, questions. But before we get away from Anthony Camello here, let's talk about uh, multiple people have said to me, and I'm sure they've said oh, to yeah. you, that this guy's a marked man now in prison. Uh, his own lawyer said Monday that he's in protective custody, yeah. and there's a good reason for that. Yeah. I mean, look what happened to Whitey Bulger uh, in, a, in a federal prison. I mean, he couldn't, there, there was no way to protect him. And if this guy's going to go in as the, the shooter of a mob boss, a lot of people, you know, uh, want to react to that, want to make a statement by going after him. So, you know, if, if this guy ends up in prison, um, I think he's going to have a very difficult time. Yeah. Can we talk about Gene Gotti for a second? Uh, sure, the yeah. newspapers, a lot of people ran right towards Gene Gotti as being behind this. The guy just got out of prison. He did yeah. 28 years, whatever he did. Yeah, for um, heroin dealing. Uh, yeah. John Gotti Jr. came out and said, they owe my uncle an apology. They owe my family an apology. Uh, everybody kind of rushed there right away. Not very smart, uh, perhaps, on some people's, but uh, your thoughts? Well, you I mean, got to get blamed for this, for something he obviously, at this point, yeah. had absolutely nothing to do with. Yeah, I mean, one thing, it, it was kind of a rush to judgment. The assumption being, this is a mob guy, he's gunned down. Uh, there's a lot of similarities between the murder of Paul Castellano. Gotti was involved in a Castellano hit, ergo, Gotti must have been involved in this one. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, that's a problem. And, and that's what happens when you've got bits and pieces of information. And that's just the nature of the business. You don't get everything at once. So that was part of that. In terms of asking for an apology, uh, who was going to apologize to whom? Yeah. You know, I mean, that, that's the other thing. And, you, and, and it's, it's, a, it's kind of a strange place to go because if you want to talk in terms of the Gottis, uh, is Gene Gotti going to apologize to the many people who are strung out on heroin because he was dealing heroin? Where's the apology for that? So you don't want to get into that. It's just, it, it doesn't make any sense. It's more, it's more everybody playing games and everybody wants to get their, their day in the spotlight. Yeah. Oh my God, look what you've done to me. Yeah. I don't think that works. All right, Anthony Camello probably owes a nice apology to Mr. Uh, Mr. Well, there Gotti you go, yeah. And the, and the family of Frank Kelly for what he did here, allegedly. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, you can go on and on with that kind of stuff. And, and, and none of this is good. 
Uh, and it's, it's part of the nature of what we're, we're dealing with here is you've got people's motivations that are suspect. You've got people with histories that kind of fit into the, the puzzle you're putting together. And it turns out, no, that, that's the wrong puzzle. These pieces don't fit here. All right. This guy's got a good lawyer, Robert Gottlieb in New York. They haven't found the gun. They found the car, the truck uh, that he used, yeah. that kind of stuff. So there's some evidence building. Um, does this even go to trial, do you think? Well. I, I would think and we're a long way away from that. Yeah, we're certainly a long way away from that. But I think, you know, what's going to be the defense here? There's apparently videotape of the, of the hit going down. Yeah, there I is. You I can see the muzzle flesh. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. I don't know how you defend that. So we'll see, in, unless you make an argument that this was a troubled individual, we may be going that way. Yeah. All right, George, let's travel back here to Philadelphia Monday. Brian McMonagle, the lawyer for Philip Narducci, who's accused of loan sharking and extortion filed a motion to delay the trial, which was supposed to start April 1st against Narducci. And in that motion has some very, very explosive allegations here that he claims came from the federal government's discovery that the guy cooperating and the key witness against Narducci was a member of a terrorist organization in Lebanon, may have falsified documents and deceived the court trying to get asylum in the United States. Your thoughts on this? Now? Yeah, I mean, you, you broke that story on Monday. Uh, the, the thing that we've said all along is the key to the case against Narducci is the credibility of this particular victim witness. And clearly there's issues that, and Brian's a master at this. Brian's going to take the information and run with it. This witness is going to have a problem when he gets up on the witness stand, not necessarily over the allegation, but what else he was involved in his involvement with the FBI, his involvement in Lebanon. Was he a terrorist? How did he get into this country? What kind of special favors did he get by cooperating with the FBI? Was he continuing to cooperate with the FBI when this was going down? I mean, we were told in the very beginning, this wasn't an investigation into Narducci. This kind of fell into the lap of the, of the government. Well, what else were they dealing with this guy about? How, how and why were they talking to him? What else does he know? Where else is he going to surface with other case? All of these things are kind of in play right now, and I think uh, it weakens the case against Phil Narducci. We've said that all along, that the, the, the case is much stronger against uh, Mr. Gallo because yeah. Gallo's voice is on tape. Yeah. We'll see how it plays out. Now, interestingly enough, in the first documents we got about this case, the FBI said he worked for them from 2001 to 2006 right. on matters of national security yeah. and that the government got him into the country, that they helped get him a status here in, in the country. Now we have some questions about how did all that happen? How did he, did he lie to the court? Did he falsify documents? Those are the allegations by McMonagle in that court document. This is serious stuff we're talking oh, about. Yeah. That the FBI would get in bed with an a, alleged terrorist from Lebanon, member of a terrorist organization, that's in court papers. It makes you really kind of say, what's going on here? Well, I mean, and that's, that's I think- On an organized crime matter. I'm not talking about the national, the national, you know, situation. I'm talking about here in Philadelphia on a loan sharking and extortion case? Well, I mean, I think the, the question that sits out there is, all right, if he was working with the FBI from 2001 to 2006, from 2006 to the present, what was he involved in? What else was he doing? We're hearing stories that this guy was borrowing money from everybody. Oh, yeah. He was a deadbeat. There's well, a list, I hear. Yeah, we're yeah. hearing stories about drugs. So if this guy is in this country uh, through the FBI, they help him get in. What obligation do they have to, to kind of oversee this guy once he's here, or is he just out there doing on his own doing what he wants to do, committing crimes? And if not, if they're involved with him in some other issues that we're not even aware of, yeah. are they allowing him to conduct himself in such a way that he's ripping people off? I mean, those are all kind of things that are going to factor in. And again, it comes back to how credible is this case going to be if the key witness, the victim, isn't himself somebody who's out there committing all kind of crimes. Brian McMonagle is going to subpoena now as many government records as he can get his hands on about this guy. How did he get in the country? What happened in the immigration court? What did he do before? What organization did he belong to? What did they know about what he did in Lebanon, if he did anything? Those kind of things. All that stuff, he's going to subpoena. That's going to slow this down, A. And B, he's going to muddy this up real good. Well, yeah, and, and, and think about it. If, if, if Brian can lay out a case that this guy was involved in some heavy-duty information, heavy-duty activity over here, and then you juxtapose that to a loan that may or may not have been legitimate, in the balance, what's the jury going to say? I mean, that, that's, that's where it comes, that's where, I mean, Brian as a defense attorney, he's a master at this kind of stuff, he'll put it in front of the jury in, in common sense terms, and I think uh, uh, that's going to be a problem for the government. This case may not be as strong as it, it seemed to be in the beginning. Philip Narducci is probably steaming right about now. 
uh, on this situation. You know, I mean, he's got to be wondering what the heck is going on here. Why are they coming after me? Uh, some of the wise guys are saying, why do they go after Narducci when we know they're working on all a whole bunch of other stuff concerning us? Well, I mean, Murders, I think etc. But you go after Narducci, you get an easy target. What was it? Well, I mean, I think the answer to that is the same answer to why Gene Gotti's name is mentioned when when uh, Cali was killed. I mean, Narducci's name is what it is. He's got a history. He's got a lot of baggage. Uh, I think. When this particular victim witness said, I'm being extorted by Narducci, bells go off, lights go off, and yeah. the FBI reacts to that. Uh, maybe they reacted too quickly, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot that we don't know about this case yet. But the other thing to remember is we're starting to see a trend where jurors are not buying into the, the testimony of cooperating witnesses who have baggage. We saw that in the Banana case. Well, let's talk about that in New York. Yeah. Two yeah. government witnesses got on. John Maringolo, one of the lawyers for the number two yeah. guy in the Banana crime family, beat up on both of those witnesses. Right. Acquittals on every charge. That's what I'm Walked saying. Walked away. The jurors are starting to be, I think, more discerning in, in, in evaluating the testimony of cooperating witnesses. And that's a good thing. Right, exactly. I mean, what happened down here in the Joe Lagambi case, uh, the same kind of thing. They weren't able to get a total conviction in that case because some jurors didn't accept the testimony of cooperating witnesses. I mean, jurors, I think, are becoming more sophisticated in terms of who are these people, why are they cooperating, what are they getting out of it? It's no longer, oh, well, you know, the government says this, ergo, it happened. Yeah. And I think we might be seeing some of that in the Narducci case as well. Again, there's, there, you know, it, it, things come out in bits and pieces. Yeah. We don't know all the details yet. Yeah, easy to jump on the media for that, too, as, it, as they come out in bits and pieces. Yeah. These are court documents that come out. As the documents come out, we report what goes on yeah. there, those kind of things. And then there's some discussions back and forth, I, all that kind of stuff. But the bottom line is, when the info comes out, you go with the info. Yeah, I mean, I, and if, I, obviously, you know, there's a, there's a whole trend in this country to beat up on the media now all the way from uh, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. The, one of the interesting things in terms of being in this business is you've got to remember you may have some facts, but you may not have the truth. Yeah. And facts, you know, you're constantly getting more and more information that shade and change the way things evolve. Yeah. And I think that's what we're seeing here in both of those cases. Could you see 12 members of a jury sitting in a federal courthouse, they hear information that this guy was allegedly a member of a terrorist organization in Lebanon and believe in the guy? In, in this day well, and time? Well, I, I think that, that that's the biggest problem he's going to have is his history, who he is, who he was. And then, what's, and then the question is, and what's he doing here? And how truthful can he be? Yeah, yeah. sure. I mean, that's always the case. All right, George, what do you think about the Narducci case? It gets delayed, but does it go away completely? I think that's a real question, and I think it's something that will play out over the next month or so as more and more documents become public. All right, we'll see you next time.